afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Remote Sensing webinar, which is the second webinar in our pre-season webinar series. So last week, we heard from the Department of Agricultural and Fisheries and the National Fruit Fly Council with a research and development update. And this week, we will be hearing about remote sensing. So for those of you who didn't get to meet me last week or out in the field so far, my name's Casey and I'll be taking over from Marine when she goes on maternity leave at the start of October. So looking forward to meeting everyone um, throughout the mango season. So, and also just in terms of the webinar from last week as well, it is now available on our YouTube channel and it will be available in the weekly newsletter as well. And in future webinars, we have a marketing webinar coming up next week, followed by a chemical update in the following week and then an export webinar the week after that as well. So just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, please mute your microphone and stop your video during the presentations. If you want to ask a question, you can unmute yourself or use the chat function. If you have technical difficulties, please let us know using the chat function so we can help you. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. There will be a follow up email with a feedback survey and the slides from today as well. All right, so first up, I would like to introduce Professor Andrew Robson and Dr. Priya Kant Sinha from the Applied Agricultural Remote Sensing Centre at the University of New England. They will be sharing an overview of the multi-scale monitoring project and results of satellite imaging and crop forecasting. Welcome, guys. Cool. Thank you very much, Casey. Uh, I can't, yeah, I can share my screen. Hang on, just a sec. Um, share screen. Boom. Can you all see my screen all right and hear me okay? Um, can't see your screen yet. Oh, now. There we go. Yep, here we Magic. go. There we go. Amazing when you press the share button. <laughs> there um, it is. Thanks, Andrew. That's right. Thanks very much, Casey. Um, you may have seen in the past some presentations about remote sensing work that we've been doing in phase one of this project. Um, this is now phase two, and we've come a long way as the following presenters will give you an update. So this is very much more than just lots and lots of pretty maps. There's a lot of groundwork going on to make sure we're measuring it right and we're using the right satellites and things like that. So this is part of a, a, a bigger project. Uh, the Mango component is part of a six industry project across Australia with um, quite a lot of participants, as you can see here. Really importantly, we're working with each of the industry groups to make sure what we develop is right and, and, and delivered in a, in a a way that's usable. So their, their um, input and all the growers inputs in this process have been really worthwhile. So we have three main objectives from this project. One is to improve pre-harvest yield forecasting at the national, the regional and the farm level. Develop adoptable tools and methodologies that improve within orchard monitoring and mapping of tree health and quality, fruit quality and maturity. And this is where it really comes in with the um, collaboration. So we've brought it together a range of really good expertise around different skill sets and tools to try and answer this question. So we're not trying to force a particular technology on anyone. And the last one is to develop and deliver improved detection and management tools for future biosecurity and natural disaster. And this includes the national mapping, which will be uh, showed to you in a minute. So when we did phase one, we had um, a couple of sites in um, Darwin, and uh, in um, Bundaberg. We're now across four major grow intensive growing regions. So Darwin, Catherine, um, Ariba, and down in um, Bundaberg. And our amount of areas we're covering is now up to 330 different blocks. So this is the ground truthing work that's going on to validate uh, what is going on. So again, we're not just pumping out lots of pretty coloured pictures. <laughs> so I will pass it on to pre account Singh now um, to give you a rundown on where we're up to. Um, he's driving a lot of remote sensing stuff at the moment. So thanks, pre account And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Hang on. I'm sure it's not hard. Um, 
stop share. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew, and uh, welcome to my presentation. Uh, I am presenting on satellite-based mango fruit estimation uh, at tree block and management level. So the result I'll be presenting is for 2019-20 season uh, for the region what uh, Andrew just showed the different farms and uh, uh, across uh, Northern Territory and North and South Queensland. Uh, so broadly, uh, my presentation has two objectives uh, to show you the forecasting uh, accuracy and the mapping that we have carried out for different farms uh, using high resolution worldview three data and then explore the possibility uh, of having a low or free uh, cost data and to determine how close we can deter, uh, we can estimate uh, the mango productivity for a few selected blocks. So I have done some comparison uh, to show you. Uh, basically, uh, what we are presenting uh, is uh, the product in the form of spatial variab variability in tree vigor, yield estimation at individual tree block and management level. And the different data uh, what uh, we have used so far is high resolution world view three sentinel planet calibration data from field and then finally harvest data to determine the accuracy so uh the first can, can we, what we do yeah. is uh Pre can can you share your screen mate we you haven't shared your screen yet <laughs> haven't oh no no <laughs> thank you Sorry. <laughs> yes, so can you see now? Yes. Yes, yeah, so the objective is to provide uh, uh, before harvest yield prediction and mapping uh, for the selected farms. Uh, and also the comparison from commercial and low cost freely accessible satellite data. Uh, so we are providing spatial variability tree vigor for different farms and then estimation prediction, uh, estimation mango productivity at tree block and management level. So in the first go, what uh, we do, we take a freely available satellite data and we classify for different farms with respect to tree vigor. And we determine the different uh, tree locations of high, median, and low vigor so that we can collect data from. So the, the map what you see is the sampling location shown on different uh, blocks. And we collect field data for these samples. And then we use that data to develop a model to do the prediction. Uh, since we have a high resolution satellite data, so we use that satellite data uh, product uh, of 1.2 meter resolution to develop the model, prediction model. And the other one is 30 meter resolution that help us to determine the individual crown. So this individual crown will help us to uh, go to tree level to see the uh, uh, health, uh, tree health or, and the productivity. So the field data is correlated with the spectral uh, response for individual tree and the correlation is used to uh, uh, diff use, used with different vegetation index and the correlation which is showing the highest uh, uh, with the field data and the uh, vegetation index that is used for model development. So the left side, what you see is the model developed for the fruit number and total fruit per tree. And that is based on the spectral response of individual tree. We also use the crown area with the, along with the vegetation index to develop the another set of models. So the basic, basic uh, idea is to do the prediction both uh, based on vegetation index response as well as vegetation index with the crown area. The developed model for a particular block, the data collected for these points are extrapolated to the entire block. 
So you have a prediction for fruit count for the entire block and also the fruit weight for the entire block. Now here you can see we can go up to individual tree level and we see that how much production is happening for that particular tree. If the blocks are of the same management zone and similar variety and similar tree age, then we extrapolate it to the management level where we have all the management blocks are uh, the 18, 18 trees data is extrapolated to the entire management. So we do the productivity estimation for the entire management uh, in, this case, in this case. Now this uh, graph shows the accuracy of uh, Worldview 3, that is high resolution based satellite data for Northern Territory last year. And the blue uh, bar, what you see is the manual estimation and the yellow one are the actual pack house. So when we compare with the actual pack house data, we see that world, uh, our satellite based estimation from the two methods, they are pretty close to the actual harvest data. In most cases, except for few under prediction uh, in this case, but they are in general doing better than uh, manual estimation and the accuracy we have reached is up to 98% at block level and 98% as well for the zone level. For another Queensland, we have pack house data available for block level as well as management level. And we, here also we can see that except for one case, we have generally very good estimation as compared to the pack house data. Uh, the manual estimation was available at zone level. So I put the graph here to do the comparison. So here also we can see that we are pretty close to the uh, pack house count. So they are doing uh, good prediction at zone level as well. Now for South Queensland, uh, the same comparison, we can see that the uh, Worldview 3 derived uh, uh, prediction in orange and gray color. So they are pretty close to the uh, pack house count in most cases. And except for these two uh, blocks, which had some issues with the uh, pack house count data uh, accuracy. I mean, it was having some issues. So that's why there is huge difference in the prediction with the actual pack house count. Otherwise, in general, it was uh, up to 93% accurate. So that was the presentation done with uh, using high resolution satellite data. But we wanted to provide growers with different options of satellite data availability and whether there is an option to have some low cost or freely available satellite platform data that we can use. Because Worldview 3 data is, uh, of course, it's a high resolution data and that is letting us to go up to individual tree level uh, uh, determination of uh, productivity, but it is costing us $7,000 and minimum uh, area that needs to be required in order to get value three data is 100 square kilometer. So we were looking for a cheap option for the growers. Uh, so that's why I have used a couple of satellite data, Planet, which is low cost, but three meter resolution and Sentinel data with 10 meter uh, uh, resolution, but it is freely available. So I've just done some comparison to see how much accuracy we can determine in productivity estimation with respect to these two satellite platforms. So this is a comparison showing uh, uh, the estimation done for Northern Territory. So last three bars, what you see, they are based on satellite data. So they are pretty close. So it looks like the Planet and Worldview 3, the Planet and Sentinel data are almost doing comparable result as compared to Worldview 3 in most cases. Uh, and definitely they are much better than the visual estimation. So it can show here that these two satellite plot platforms will be some sort of uh, used as a complement to expensive worldview three data. There's a few more results for North Queensland. We can see the three satellite platforms are pretty comparable. And also for South Queensland, in most cases, they are pretty okay and they are pretty close to Worldview 3 based estimation. Now, uh, we have two choices. Either, either we are going for commercial available satellite data or free or low cost data. 
So as we can see that since it is high resolution data, we can go up to individual tree level. We can determine the productivity at each level. So if there is any management requirement uh, up to tree level is required, then we can obviously go for high resolution supply data, but it is costing us and there is a minimum area requirement also. There is another issue that if we are delineating tree crown, the tree crown doesn't remain constant. It can grow big next year or it, there will be some pruning. So each year we need to modify the crown. As you can see, I display the crown area over the this year satellite data and we, we need some modification in order to match the actual crown for this year. So at block level, we can use the planet and sentinel data and this is the result I have put here as a comparison. Since Worldview 3 data is high resolution, we, resolution data, we have an option to eliminate the in-between spacing. And it looks like the tree are uh, nicely delineated. But planet and sentinel being low resolution data, we can't have this uh, option to delineate the, uh, the interspace uh, uh, area. So we have a general production estimation. We can see the more pixelated for the sentinel. But if you see the general pattern, you can see the high productivity area are in this, and they are also showing in the value three. So uh, distribution wide, they look pretty similar, but uh, if you want an individual tree level information, we need high resolution data. This is the comparison at block level. When uh, I have not used the tree crown boundary to do the prediction. And again, we can see that uh, the three satellites are pretty comparable. So it, it shows that when uh, the accuracy is not far behind from planet and sentinel. So that has given some sort of uh, indication that we have uh, an option to go for low cost of free uh, satellite data for uh, block level prediction estimation. There are some advantage of using this free or low cost data because they are freely available. So we can download as many data uh, throughout the season for different years. So we can develop a time series model to, to see the past relationship of uh, plant or tree response, a uh, spectral response with respect to yield or disease or pest. So that will allow us to do some time series analysis. And also it helps us to delineate or to find out high or low bigotry that we use to collect calibration data from. So in summary, the result looks very uh, promising. Uh, that's showing the potential of remote sensing for yield forecasting and mapping. Uh, that is high resolution data, but the comparison of free and low cost satellite data also helped us to determine the level of accuracy we can achieve like tree level or block level or management level and accuracy uh, were found pretty comparable. So that has provided growers with uh, different options uh, for their effective farm management in terms of price and resolution and range of information that can be generated. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Priya Kant and Andrew. Does anyone have any questions? No questions? All righty. Well, thanks guys, we'll, uh, we'll move on. So next, I'd like to introduce Craig Shepherd and Joel McKechnie, who are both researchers at the Applied Agricultural Remote Sensing Centre at the University of New England as well. And they'll be sharing about mapping horticultural tree crops in Australia. Welcome, guys. So just give me a second, I need to unshare it. Uh, Should be up the top, I think. Um, pre yeah. Oh, yeah. There yeah. you go. Yep, Thank there you. we go. All right. Joel and Craig, welcome. Uh, thanks very much, Casey. Um, I'm just showing my screen now, and I've got Joel in the side there. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to present our work to you. Um, this may not be the first time you've seen the work presented, as Andrew covered off. Uh, in 2017, we delivered the first phase one map 
of commercial mango orchards around the country. And it's great to be back under the phase two project. So the presentation today will cover off what was achieved in phase one, what we're undertaking in phase two. I've got some example applications of the mapping to share with you. I'm gonna highlight one of the challenges and we'll really appreciate you sticking with us because at the conclusion, I'll be demonstrating uh, one of our applications in which you can assist us in building the most accurate map possible by using a land use survey. So in phase one, we published uh, the first national baseline map of avocado, macadamia and mango orchards across Australia. Um, it was a map just of the commercial crops and I'm highlighting just a mango one now. Um, and the scale or minimum mapping unit we worked to then was two hectares. So we set about mapping all commercial orchards greater than two hectares. And as an example, you can see the information presented simply shows the mango crop. Um, when we observed it, in this instance, it was in 2016 and the area. So it's simply location and extent only. Features are aggregated across uh, roads or drainage lines. Um, such that no property boundaries, no commercial or privacy information is included. It's just location and extent. That was phase one. Coming back to phase two, we're now updating the map. And we're also going to include three more additional industries, so citrus, olive and banana. And this work has really just been progressing this year. Um, so Joel and I have now updated the Bundaberg region um, so this presents the most recent mapping. We've also updated wet tropics and tablelands, including the major growing region of Dimbula. Um, and this is all presented in some of the applications I'll cover off shortly uh, for you to use um, yourselves. So phase two is a more refined map. As I said, the scale will move up to one hectare. But it's important to understand it still befits a national map. Um, we're not getting to block level. Um, it's simply too big a job. Um, so here's an example of some of the phase two mapping that's been published. Again, mango trees, and this time observed in 2020. So how the mapping comes together, we're remote sensing scientists at heart. Um, so in our day jobs, we interpret uh, multiple sources of imagery, whether it be satellite, airborne, and street view. The beauty of this information nowadays is that much of it is open source and freely available, um, which works really well when mapping established tree crops, um, not so for the new crops, and I'll cover that shortly. Um, what I'd like to draw to your attention is the challenge of interpreting imagery, is that there's four different examples there, or presenting um, trees in different growth stages and management practices. They are all mangoes. Um, so this is what can be a challenge uh, for Joel and I, and so to complement our mapping, we also include a range of ancillary data sets to inform our decision-making, which also extends to field work. Oh, I have to mention the frosty mango. So that's captured out of street view imagery. It's amazing where we can inform our interpretation. <laughs> field work is um, extremely important in building a most accurate map possible. Uh, to improve our thematic accuracy. So from above, you appreciate uh, discerning these tree crops from one another is challenging, even when they are the same crop, as per the last example. Um, the fieldwork also greatly aids in areas where we're experiencing lots of growth in horticulture tree crops, as we can observe the new crops in the ground and log them. So the mapping presented here, this is actually out of our industry engagement web app and you too can view the information just like I'm showing now. Um, it presents the mapping along with our land use survey observations. Now many of these have been made in the field. I'll draw your attention to this feature here, which is mapped as a citrus crop. Yet if you look at the imagery, that is actually pasture or likely sugarcane before that. Uh, and yet here's our field observation. Lots of new lime trees uh, going in the ground. Um, given the, um, the forum we're in, I've also included an example for mango. So Joel and I just returned from undertaking the field validation from Townsville to Gladstone last week. And here's one of our observations where we've got an existing orchard. We've made an observation in the field. 
and we've included a photo as well and this is that one there. So again, new trees in the ground. So in updating this mapping post field work, uh, Joel and I will uh, look at some other imagery to discern how far this crop extends and edit that feature into the map. So what are the final products? Well, it's simply outputs, including the tree crop location and extent. And what we're now doing is taking advantage of the web enabled capacity to deliver spatial information to anyone, anywhere in a browser. You don't need a GIS, which Joel and I both have on our desktops. Um, we're simply able to present this information to you uh, via the internet. And I've got a neat little graphic on the side illustrating how this is advanced, um, particularly in the natural disaster response space of a group of five hiders pouring over a paper-based map. Now the currency of the information on that map would only be of the day it was printed. Yep. How they are adjusting, and you can too, is you should be consuming this information live um, through a smart device. So there's the URL. My colleague Joel will drop that into the chat for you and you're welcome to browse over just a selection of some of the web applications we've built. Uh, this page will grow as we continue to add more content. So let's uh, have a look at some of those applications. The most recent one we're most proud of is our dashboard, which summarises industry demographics across Australia. And there's a neat little tool at the top where you can select a growing region. And I'm just going to hopefully we've got some people on the line from Darwin. And the little widgets at the bottom automatically summarise the extent of the orchards within the view. So as you zoom in and around the map, you're presented with updated stats, um, which really illustrate the demographics by crop across Australia. So this is just one application. There are others available to you across our web gallery. I encourage you to um, try each of them out. They all differ in the theme or the um, the application for use, um, but ultimately they're all presenting the same data. So please take the time to have a look at the gallery. What's also featured there is the natural disaster response application that we built for the recent bushfire issues across last summer. California is now experiencing the same. Um, so it's just a live web application. Um, the beauty of this one is that the data presenting the burnt area extent of the fire front was updated live based on authoritative data that we sourced uh, from Geoscience Australia. So an example of that, um, here's a neat satellite image taken on New Year's Day of the active fire front moving away from Jarvis Bay in southern New South Wales. And if we zoom into our map, this is the resultant burnt area extent. This has been finalised now, but at the time that was growing and effectively changing potentially every 10 minutes. Uh, and there's an example of an olive grove, which um, is potentially in the impact zone. Uh, it's important that when you're interpreting these maps that, uh, and we take great care in doing this, that the information that's presented is authoritative. And this is why. Um, so you might recall this map was shared a lot during that event. Um, Rihanna posted it on her Twitter feed and she has 97 million followers uh, and 346,000 of them liked it. Um, so it's worth noting that um, uh, there are better maps out there. <laughs> Another application is the tropical uh, cyclones. So this one was the Cyclone Debbie event, um, critical to informing uh, the potential impacts and the recovery. Um, what the centre are seeking to do is build a new severe weather application um, which will feature live authoritative data from the bomb to include radar information as rainfall, tropical cyclone events and thunderstorms as they unfold. Um, it's not live yet but here's a little screenshot of when some thunderstorms were, on, were outside the Gold Coast where I am. Um, you can see the power of this information when overlaid with our map of tree crops um, can really relate to significant potential impact events. So look out for that one on our web gallery. We're hopeful of having that up before cyclone season. 
Another application is the biosecurity space, um, particularly for TR4 response in bananas. There's the mapping of uh, plantations in, around the Tully catchment. And I think you can all appreciate the application there for managing um, response and recovery to um, positive detections. Uh, in the mango space, as part of the phase two project, we're also collaborating with um, the Commonwealth Northern Australian Quarantine Service, together with Biosecurity Queensland, um, to map the abandoned mango trees in the Cape. So the potential of that mapping is it may get to single tree level. Um, and that's another ongoing um, element of our work. Um, so we'll be working with uh, Robert at AMRA for that too. Other challenges. So this is where you can help us. So peer review is an important part of science and spatial is no different. So we've got an application that's available from our gallery called the Industry Engagement Web App. And it really came to the fore in the latest mapping for Bundaberg where there's been so much growth. And here's an example of a feature where someone, a third party, a stakeholder, maybe the grower, doesn't matter. It's all anonymous. I've digitized out a feature in blue and we've since updated the map accordingly where they identified, I'll have to click out, slide and grab in. They simply dropped a, a polygon feature on our web app, called it Mango. Um, and we were able to look at alternative imagery to discern that there are actually trees there, despite what the imagery is showing. Really, really valuable. Uh, best to use this application on your desktop. And the results across Bundaberg is each of those blue polygons or a little eye is a point observation, allowed Joel and I to interpret them and build the best and most current product we could prior to publishing it. The other means you can undertake to help us build a real accurate map is to complete a land use survey. So I've just switched them on now. So these are all the survey observations which have been logged around this area. They exist everywhere and they're just a point-based observation discerning the land use and potentially a photo. So I'd like to share with you now how to actually complete a land use survey. Uh, it'll run on a browser on your smart device, which is the best place to use it because your smart device isn't just a phone anymore, it also has a GPS. So I'm gonna do it from my desktop and you can launch it here out of our map gallery. And I'll just come across and I'll take you to this page here. There's a short little video which covers why we're seeking this information, how we use it. Um, and the little link at the bottom will launch the survey. And it's a form-based solution, which also includes location. And that's the spatial part that Joel and I find so valuable to inform our mapping update. So to launch much like this on whatever device you're using, um, I don't have a GPS in my laptop, but you'll have one on your phone or iPad. And what I suggest you do is just click the find my location and the map will locate to where you are. So I can't do that, but I can search for Bowen or another street address. You might do something similar. Um, and we'll come on in. And ideally what we're seeking to do is drop the pin um, either on your orchard or the observation you're trying to discern. So I'm just gonna do the airport. I'll just drop my pin there and then I can come around, hit may go. Yes, I'm confident. If you're on farm, you could take an Im image as well, which is helpful, um, but otherwise just click submit. And that information then gets sent um, to the UNE and we'll interpret it in the context of all the other ancillary data and other information um, to interpret and build the national tree crop map. Thank you very much, I'll leave it there. Thanks guys. Joel, do you have anything to add to, to what Craig said? No, Craig nailed it and didn't experience any technical <laughs> difficulties, so um, I'm free. <laughs> Beautiful, thanks guys. If we guys. have any questions, I'm more than happy to help answer those. Does anyone have any questions for these guys?
I'll just um, draw some attention to some stuff that's in the chat. So Marcello actually asked, can it detect frost damage? And Joel replied, not yet. We are developing a severe weather app which might address frost. So Craig actually explained that as well. And Andrew said that Craig is showing the bomb weather data. Additionally, we can introduce spatial layers such as topography to show low lying areas that may be more susceptible to frost. Also, we can access historic remote sensing data to identify when and where frost may have occurred in the past and then better predict high risk zones in the future. Lastly, the introduction of strategically located infield sensors can better warn when those high risk areas are being exposed to frost. And just reiterating that the map does not include any personal grow information or pro productivity information. It is only a polygon that shows the class, whether it is mangoes, macadamias or other. Thanks very much, um, Andrew and Joel, for elaborating and, and answering that question there. So if we've got no further questions um, on that talk, thanks, guys. We will move on. So next, I would like to introduce Professor Kerry Walsh from Central Queensland University, who will be sharing a presentation titled Can't See the Orchard for the Trees? Uses for Machine Vision. So welcome, Kerry. Thanks, Casey. You're hearing me and seeing that presentation okay? We sure are. Thanks, Kerry. All right. So, um, the intent of this is to address the issues of forward estimation of harvest timing and harvest load. And every grower's got their own approach to this, how, that, how they you know, make that forward estimate. Uh, I'll just give a story of a Brazilian um, system. So this, this particular farm that they're selling, 90% of their, their product goes to Europe, mostly to Europe, a bit to Russia. 5% it goes to the domestic market. This one farm's got 700,000 trees with 100,000 coming on as young trees. So big, big production. Uh, 300 blocks, roughly 1,500 trees per block. Five managers looking after 60 blocks each. For harvest timing, in the past, they would go out and count panicles, get their eye in, counting the number of panicles on the tree, and just get their eye in to estimate that by, by view as you drive through the orchard. And they would drive through uh, to eyeball the percentage of, of terminals. As of a couple of years ago, they drive every third row every Monday morning, and they will score the blocks as they reach 20% of terminals flowering, and again, when they reach 80%, it gives a window. Uh, remembering this is uh, uh, an area of Brazil where they can produce mangoes 12 months of the year, so that they've got blocks coming on every month. Uh, so the heat units are then applied to get the beginning and the end of the harvest period, and they'll use different heat units. The less mature fruit gets sent to uh, Russia, so 1,500 heat units for that market. So that's harvest timing. For crop load, they will do estimations five weeks before harvest. Uh, their preferred method, if they've got the time, they will go in and count 30 trees, get an idea of the variation. Some blocks are more variable than others. If it's more variable, they can count more trees. Uh, typically, they'll be counting 5% of all the trees. If the standard deviation is more than 5% of the mean, if, if, if it's more variable, they will count up to 10% of the trees in the block. Uh, so in a 1,500 tree block, typical block, they'll be counting 75 trees. Uh, their typical trees are about 200 fruit per, per tree. If they don't have time, the old way that they used to do it was just drive through and sort of look at the tree and gauge how many crates. They pick into 20 kilogram uh, crates with stalks on, um, so they just gauge it from that. And if they don't have time for that, they'll fall back to just the flower estimate for so history. They also look at fruit size. Uh, the different markets, UK, Europe, they, they want different size fruit. Previously, they would harvest 100 fruit one week before harvest, and they would weigh it. Um, but that would be not representative, they were finding. It wasn't agreeing with the pack house totals. Typically, because you're grabbing fruit from the outside canopy, not totally representative. Uh, so as of last year, they've begun taking manual measurements of the length, the width, the thickness of the fruit. Uh, they do many more fruit, 
and they'll tag it and monitor it uh, over a week or two get an idea of the rate of increase. So there's a pretty intensive system for monitoring uh, growth. So here, here we are in this project just trying to look at ways to automate that process for estimation of flowering, for fruit load, for fruit size and harvest timing. Uh, another group in the greater project is Sirius. They do uh, aerial thermal imaging. They happen to be overflying one of the mango farms in the Territory. So this is just a couple of snaps to give an idea of what that sort of information could be good for. Uh, blue represents cooler, red is hotter. So th there could be some problems with irrigation in, in this line. Uh, who knows what's happening in this block as to why the irrigation, it, why there's this graded pattern of hot, middle and cool. So there's one technology that's worth um, watching further. Ourselves, we um, are looking at this machine vision. We're improving the, the hardware here in, in terms of its robustness, ease of use. Uh, so we've got two cameras looking at the two sides of the trees uh, and then a machine learning system that can automatically process that data. In this case, count the number of panicles. And we're counting to three stages before Christmas tree, at Christmas tree and later than Christmas tree. Uh, and then it will pop that information up onto our, our fruit maps display in terms of the number of panicles per, per tree. You know, one week later, it, it's expanding. And what we're learning, trying to learn at this moment is how to use that information. Uh, here's the total number of panicles, the stage one and the stage two. So stage one dropping, stage two increasing. So a small flowering event, stage one increasing again, and stage two following, so a second flowering event. So we're trying to learn how to read that data to capture the flowering timing. Uh, we can couple that to infield sensors on, on temperature that's logging the actual max and min per, per day against the 10 year average for the site. Uh, and therefore, if you've got the flowering event time, you can forward predict the, the, the harvest uh, time. So just trying to make all that automate it basically to, to make it easier to, to use. So here are two flowering events, two uh, potential harvest events. Uh, and, and once again, just, you know, what we're trying to link these things to make it automated. So take that uh, processed data, just automatically processed, pick the information up, feed it into the app, make the prediction um, of, of harvest times. Just to go back, and Priya Khan talked uh, about this as well, but looking at what we played with last year and now changing from flowering into fruit load estimation, uh, Priya Khan talked to the satellite uh, estimates. The machine vision is an alternate, uh, alternative approach to the harvest load, as opposed to the manual counts as the third uh, estimate. So in the, in the following tables, we've got the, the block data, the pack house data, the manual count where that was made, and as you know, not all relatively few growers do make a manual count, the satellite and the machine vision. Um, so we've, we've got um, uh, those estimates. Um, I think it's got a screen in the way. Uh, so different blocks, the pack house count, and then this is just a ratio to the pack house count. So the manual counts overall for, for this group, this farm, uh, they did very well in total, but they're up and down, you know, 1.5, 150% of the pack hours, 70%. So their variability was, was, was high. The satellite and the machine vision. And we've done that last year across many blocks. Uh, in total about 30, 43. Uh, not always for all methods. But in total, you can see the manual uh, for the, the, the blocks that was done for, the satellite, uh, two methods and the, the machine vision. So they're getting into the realm of um, you know, usability. This year we're hammering that in on more farms, more locations. Uh, so it, it's time for the industry to look carefully and see what's what's useful, basically. This season, we, as I mentioned, we're operating on, on a, a slew of farms from Darwin to Catherine, North Queensland and South Queensland. Um, Precan's just organising this satellite capture up in in far north Queensland, uh, operating on these farms. But if your farm is in this area, uh, there's the potential to do some extra work uh, on your locations. Uh, here's some results from the machine vision up in Darwin two weeks ago. Uh, so that's 
driving those rows and counting uh, the fruit. So there's a fruit count for this entire farm, as there was last year. It's way down at this point compared to last year, whether that's a, um, an actual thing. It's very spread out. So we've got young fruit still, are, still yet to be counted. The machine vision is only counting fruit above a certain size. Uh, so just learning how to use this uh, appropriately, I guess, is where we're up to with the technologies. And ultimately, it's a matter of linking all those things, you know, to get the flowering information, the heat units, the fruit load information, the fruit size information to get the, the harvest um, predictions, so combining those sets of information. Uh, and that's, that's basically it. Uh, we are also playing in that, uh, taking that machine vision technology into a harvest, uh, auto harvest um, uh, tire with, um, technology, so, so using the machine vision to control arms that will reach out the front, putting it onto a harvest aid base. So hopefully by this January, we should be out with some um, demonstration activity that we'll, we'll see basically how, how we're going in terms of speed and uh, percent efficiency. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Kerry. Does anyone have any questions for Kerry? No, I'll just share my screen again. Does anyone have any further questions for any of the other speakers that we've talked to today? No, we're all good. All right, well, just a reminder, guys, that we've got some more webinars coming up in the following weeks. Next Wednesday, we will have a marketing webinar and it will start at 1 p.m. And then the following Wednesday, we will have a chemical update webinar. And then the following Wednesday after that, we will have an export webinar. So lots of information coming up over the next few weeks for everyone. All right, so I'll just take, take a moment to um, thank our speakers for speaking today and sharing what you've been doing. It's been very interesting. And thank you everyone um, who has dropped in and, and listened to what they had to say today. We might finish up there. Thanks guys. If anyone wants to send an email later, if a question outside of this, they're more comfortable ringing or send an email, please encourage you to do so. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Have a great week. Bye. Thank you.